So we must take up our spiritual weapons and we must seek the refuge of God. He is a strong and mighty tower. The devil is defeated today by his power. The Lord our God is strong and mighty. The Lord our God is mighty in battle. Sound the alarm on the holy mountain. Wonderful, powerful, mighty in his power. Oh, he is wonderful, powerful, and mighty in his power. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is fighting for us. And everything that he does, everything that he teaches us, everything that he's trying to get through to us, everything he does for us is him fighting for us, is him fighting on our behalf. And um, just to keep that in mind, that God is for us. He's for us. There's only one spiritual force that's against you, and that's the enemy. God is for you. Praise God. Um, I just want to kind of start with this visual demonstration for you. Um, let's say that we are all armed, you know, with a weapon. And let's say that we're all standing and somebody comes in that door that we all recognize to be an enemy. And so the person at the pulpit, who at, at this time is me, says, okay, everybody, get your weapons out. Ready? Aim. And you all take aim at that person at the door. But look at the way we're positioned. Look at where you're sitting, where you would be standing. If you took aim at that one enemy at the door, Who's in your way? Who's standing in the direct line of your weapon as you're aiming it toward the enemy? Do you understand? You're standing, we're standing in a group. We're not in any particular formation. So if somebody says, ready, aim, and we're all aiming at one thing, you know what's going to happen? If we all fire, there are going to be some casualties in here. Because your brother and your sister are standing in, in your line of fire. And so, uh, before you fire, you have to observe who's in front of you. Because who's in front of you might not be the true enemy that you're really aiming for. So we can't just say, well, that's too bad. They shouldn't have been in the way. Right? So brothers and sisters, we don't want to, we don't want to shoot the, the people that we're fighting with. We, we want to make sure that we're targeting the right enemy. So that's what we're going to talk about, um, is that there's an enemy in the camp. Thank you all. And we need to know who our enemy is. Um, so for a scripture, if you will all turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I have a lot of scriptures, but this one we're going to make our theme scripture for today. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 11 and 12. And if you do not mind, we're going to stand for the word. Most of the scriptures that um, I read today are going to be in the ESV version, uh, English Standard Version of the Bible. Um, one or two will be the New Living Translation, but uh, that's fine. So I will just read the scripture. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, 
against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You may be seated. So we're not wrestling against flesh. Flesh is, and when we talk about flesh, we're not talking about skin. We're talking about the physical nature of human beings, human nature. We're not fighting against human nature, against just human beings. We're fighting against spiritual forces, which means that these are forces that you cannot see. Um, so these are the powers and the principalities and these uh, spiritual uh, powers over this present darkness, the sin that's in the world, the spirits that are coming, they take advantage of people. That's what we're actually fighting against. So um, first, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, says, for though we walk in the flesh, meaning we live in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Okay, you cannot pull out any physical weapon and shoot the enemy. Satan, because we're fighting against something that we, that is not seen. So we're not waging war according to the flesh, which means that our, our natural weaponry is not going to work against the enemy. So the first thing that we want to do is identify the enemy. And in identifying the enemy, the first thing we want to do is be aware of Satan's tactics. Okay. So this is a part of identifying the enemy, is being aware of Satan's tactics. So 2 Corinthians, again, chapter 2, verse 11. And it's in the middle of a thought there, and I've, I've typed out all my scriptures, um, but I did not get the one that goes above that thought. I know that um, Paul is admonishing the Corinthian church. So 2.11, he says, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. The KJV says, uh, we are not ignorant of his devices, meaning we know how he works. That's what he's saying. We're familiar with his evil schemes. So we have to be, become familiar with the way that the enemy works. And uh, there are many ways that the enemy works, but we're going to put them into three categories. We're going to say deception, accusation, and discord. Or division. Deception, accusation, and discord. And I'm going to give you a scripture for each of these um, if you want to just jot it down. For deception, we have John 8, 44. I told you I have a lot of them, so I'll just read them. Um, if you're writing, you can write them down and refer again to them. John 8, 44, for deception. It says for you, Jesus is talking to the um, Pharisees and the, the Jews that are coming against him, okay? He's saying, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So that is one of the main ways that the enemy works is deception. How does he work um, deception? Uh, he, it's not always necessarily somebody just coming out and telling a bold-faced lie in front of you. Deception, he whispers things in your ear. He starts talking to you about things and, and making things appear the way they are not. He'll take a little bit of truth, mix them up with a whole lot of lies, and try to spoon-feed you. Okay? That's how the enemy works with deception. Like, um, well, I'm just going to, Go on. I think my example is better for accusation. So he works to deceive, to tell you that something is not true. Like God doesn't love you. If he loved you, then X, Y, Z wouldn't be happening. Deception. God is love. That is who he is. But the enemy makes you think that because certain things aren't going on the way they should, you feel they should go on, then it must be evidence that God doesn't love you. But that's impossible because God is love. Okay, deception. Um, accusation. I have Revelations chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before the Lord. The accuser of the brethren, he accuses them. How does he work in accusation? Not only does he work for you in your own life and mine, trying to bring guilt and condemnation, 
you know God ain't hardly, he's not checking for you. You're trying to pray and he's like, that's not going through because you, you're not right. Okay, that's deception and accusation. But he also works this way. You know she saw you. You know she saw you. She looked right past you. You know, D accusation, well, she knew what, she knew that. She knew I didn't like that. He knew, he knew, he said that. He said that on purpose. He was targeting me when he said that. Accusation, making you judge other people's motives, which we are none of us capable of, right? I know she meant that. I know what she meant. Do you really? Yeah, because I know her. I know people like her. But do you really? Be, pay attention to the spirit of what is coming to your mind. If the spirit of what is coming to your mind is not producing that life, those good feelings toward other people, it's not coming from God. It's not your discernment. It's accusation. Okay? The other way that we have is discord or division. Uh, the scripture I have for that is Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 19. And I kind of want to dwell on this, these uh, verses here. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. And again, I'm doing this in the English Standard Version. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. It's like saying there are six, no, seven things that are an abomination to God. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. These are things that God hates. He, he can't be with those things because God isn't about sin. And those are, those are, the spirit of those things is the spirit of the devil. You see in there that deception and that accusation. Okay, so I want to kind of, um, I want to define a few things in this, and then I want to provide an example. These are things that God hates now. He, and I want to kind of focus on that last part, verse 19, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord, discord. Discord is defined, um, Webster's Dictionary, as a lack of agreement or harmony could be between persons, things, or ideas. A lack of agreement or harmony. Um, actually, Minister Matt kind of touched on that last week. You know, he talked about if the musicians are up here and each one is doing their own thing. That's, that's discord, okay? It doesn't produce a pleasant sound. We sing, you know, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Let it be a sweet sound. We're not talking about literally how we sing. We're talking about the heart with which we're singing, okay? So that's discord when things are not aligned, when there's a lack of agreement or harmony. Discord is also active quarreling or conflict resulting from discord among people or factions. It's active quarreling or conflict resulting from discord among people or factions. It's strife. Discord is strife. Strife is a bitter, sometimes violent conflict or dissension. It's an act of contention. It's a fight. It's a struggle. That's what strife is. And you can have strife within yourself, or there could be strife among people. Okay? Either way, it's just a measure of discord. Because you could have things warring within you, or you could have strife among your brethren. It's a bitter, sometimes violent conflict or dissension. It's an act of contention. Um, it's also, and this one we want to pay attention to as well, it's exertion or contention for superiority. Strife. Somebody wants to be at the top. They're fighting to be on top. Okay? That's strife. And just to, just to kind of make it clear for you, I have a few things, sentiments, synonyms, right? Things that mean the same thing. Conflict, disharmony, disunity, division, friction, infighting, schisms, war. They don't sound good. Words that are the opposite of strife and discord? Accord, agreement, harmony, and peace. Okay, 
So I just wanted to make that picture clear. So the scripture in Proverbs says there are six, no, seven things that are an abomination to God. An abomination is something that is regarded with disgust or hatred. That, he doesn't like that. And he talked about a haughty spirit. That is somebody who's blatantly and disdainfully proud. Haughty is disdainfully proud, like, you know, that kind of looking down. Even it's, it could be in your heart, not on your face. You understand? Okay. It's um, synonyms for haughty are arrogant, high-handed, self-asserting, trying to push yourself forward, stiff-necked, you know, stubborn. <laughs> okay. Um, opposites of that are humble, lowly, modest. So these are things that God does, that don't please God at all, not, not even close to pleasing God. So what I wanted to show, so we've got, we're aware of his tactics, their deception, accusation, and discord or division. Now we've identified the enemy, and the enemy that we're referring to today is discord. Because you have to know how the enemy works. And one of the chief ways that he works is that division, discord. Okay, he might isolate you or he might try to cause that friction, that infighting, those schisms, right? He causes strife. That's not ever from God. It just isn't. It just isn't from God. Even if you're right and you're still contentious, that contention is not from God. Okay. Um, so now let's find out how discord operates. We're still talking about identifying the enemy. We've we got to be aware of his tactics. We've got those three. We've identified the enemy, the named it as discord. This is, this is what God wants to target at this time, okay? That spirit of discord. And now we want to see how it operates. And this is where I kind of want to get a biblical example. There are two, two ways that I have, okay? Maybe not the only ways, but two ways that came to me for how discord operates. And one we're pretty familiar with, we're pretty, you know, disagreements, Discord operates through disagreements. James chapter 4 verse 1 says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your desires are at war within you? Right? Remember I said strife could be internal, it could also be external. But when it's internal and it hasn't been resolved, then it will manifest outside. Okay? That this is what causes the wars and the divisions. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, can two walk together except they are in agreement? Right? If I decide, if two of us decide we're going to go and we're going to take a walk in the park. But I said, mm, I don't want to go this way because they have a lot of bugs and stuff. And you say, well, I don't want to go this way because there's no shade. I'm, I, like, it's too much. So you, we decide we're going to take a walk together in the park, but we both decide that we're going to go in two different ways. Are we walking together? No, we're not walking together. We might think that we're going to the same destination, but we're totally not walking together. Right? You can't have a nice conversation that way. Right? Unless we're just going to walk and text each other. Did you see that? No, I didn't see that. I'm on the other side of the park. <laughs> so, no. How can two people walk together if they've unless they've agreed how to get there? They've agreed to go in the same direction. So just because you're trying to get to the same destination doesn't mean that you're walking with someone. Does that make sense? Okay? We're all trying to see Jesus, but that doesn't mean you're walking in alignment with who you're supposed to be walking in alignment with. Um, so disagreements is one of the ways that discord works. And the enemy tries to make you think that if you don't agree, you just can't. You, I just can't. I just can't with that person. Okay? But that's not necessarily true. Unison in music is everybody singing or playing the exact same notes. That's unison. Harmony is they're playing the same song, different notes, but they meld together in a beautiful way. That's harmony. So when the praise scene gives up, we try to sing different parts. That's harmony. If we're all singing the exact same thing, that's unison. But you know what? It's still, both of them are still unity. Okay? So just because you don't necessarily agree with something doesn't mean that you have to cause discord. Okay? As long as you're singing the same melody. As long as our life is still a sweet sound to the Lord. Okay? All right, the other way we've got disagree, how discord operates, disagreements. And the other way is what I call the spirit of Absalom. 
the spirit of Absalom or the Absalom spirit. This is what I call it. Don't think I've heard anybody else say it. I'm not trying to be brand new, but that's just how it's come to my mind. And let me just make clear that the Lord's kind of been talking to me about this for a while. All right. So I, I call it the Absalom spirit. It's deception at work. And I'm going to give you the range of scripture. And then I'm just going to try to summarize it for you. Absalom, well, the scripture is 2 Samuel chapter 13, all the way through chapter 15, and then you can end it through chapter 18. Frankly, you can just go from 13 to 18. You really should read it, you know, if you don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, there's so many, when I say stories, they're histories, right, because it's fact, but there's so many things in there that you can learn, learn from. Um, so let me tell you about Absalom, in, in case you're not familiar with him, and refresh your memory if you are. Absalom was, everybody knows who King David was in the Bible, yes? King David, David and Goliath, you know, he, God gave David the kingdom because he had a heart for God and Saul didn't. Saul, you know, that's the whole disobedience is better than sacrifice. That's Saul, Saul the king. He just didn't do right. Didn't do right. God took the kingdom from him and his seed, gave it to David. So David has the kingdom now. He has many sons. And his third son born to him was named Absalom. Absalom's mom was a princess, okay? So Absalom was already, you know, in favor because all of David's, all of David's wives and concubines weren't princesses. But Absalom's mom was the daughter of a king. Absalom was very handsome. The Bible says he was handsome. You know, if the Bible says it, it had to be true. Right. Second Samuel 14, 25 talks about how beautiful Absalom was. It says there was nobody in the whole land as nice looking as Absalom. So he was nice looking. He was a third son of David, but well favored. David loved his son. Okay, he, he favored this one. Absalom had so much hair, he cut it once a year. And every time he cut it, there was five pounds of hair that he had cut. Yeah. Absalom wasn't losing it here anytime soon. I'm just saying, okay. So this is who he is. Now, but Absalom was beautiful on the outside, really only, okay? We're talking about the spirit of Absalom, deception at work, how the enemy sows discord, okay? So Absalom has had a brother, uh, because of David's sin with Bathsheba, the Lord told him, there's some things that are going to go on in your household. David's sin opened up his bloodline for other sins to happen. Let me make that clear. Sins of the father, okay? Because what David did was wrong. Not only did he commit adultery, but then he tried to kill somebody to cover it up. He killed someone to cover it up. Not good. And he was the king over the kingdom. God couldn't let that just go, okay? So some of the things that we're seeing in David's children are a direct result of what David, his disobedience to God, because David knew what he was doing, all right? So anyway... Uh, Absalom had a half-brother. He had a whole sister who was beautiful. Let's face it, if the brother is beautiful, she might be the same genes, you know what I mean? So she was pretty. Now, Absalom had a half-brother who violated his sister to protect the little ears in here, okay? Violated his sister, and Absalom was not pleased. Now, nothing happened to this brother. David didn't really punish him. He said he was really, he got really mad, and that's it. Okay. So Absalom, he didn't say anything. He told his sister, don't say anything. So she went to live. Now, he literally ruined her life because back then, if that happens, that's the end of your life because a woman can only marry if she was pure, okay? So that was the end of her life. So Absalom took his sister in. He was like, don't worry about it. Don't say anything. It's all good. We're, we're, I got you. Two years he waited to get his revenge. Two years. He invited all of his brothers to his house. And he told his servants, now when he gets good and distracted, I want you to kill him. They were like, what? He was like, don't worry. No, no, no. Don't worry. I got you. I, I'm going to cover you. Just kill him. So that's what they did. So Absalom waited two years, invited all his brothers over for a feast, and under false pretenses, killed his half-brother for what he did to his sister. So um, he got his revenge, but he had to flee the country because that was murder. All his brothers, at first David thought all of his sons, the first report came that all his sons were dead, but it was only the one. So this is the thing. David favored Absalom, 
maybe because it looked nice, you know, son of his strength, that's, that's my boy right there, you know. But David wasn't disciplining him the way he should have. So Absalom was exiled. But did you know that David sorrowed more for his absent son than he did for the one who was killed? David, it said he was comforted. You have to read this. It says, okay, he got over the fact that his son died. Then he just wanted to see the one who killed him. He just wanted to see Absalom. So anyway, Absalom was exiled. Um, I'm going to try to make this long story short. He, um, through the captain of the guard, Joab, he got himself back in favor with his father. He was like, well, you know, I really want to come back. And so David was like, okay, fine. He can come back, but he can't see my face. Like, you're not going to ever, we're not going to, you're not coming to my house. We're not doing that. Okay, so you can come back in town. So he's no longer in exile, but you won't see my face. But after a while, Absalom was like, dude, I may as well have stayed away if I wasn't ever going to see my dad. So Joab, the captain of the host, he, he got him to convince David to basically bring Absalom back in favor with his father, David. And so that's what happened. So you're thinking, wow, that's some serious mercy. And then some of you are thinking, well, you know, what he did was justified. Whatever you're thinking in your heart about it, murder is wrong, right? But he got back into favor with David. You would think, wow, that's mercy. What a great thing that his dad didn't allow him to be killed because he murdered. What, you know, a great thing that David finally allowed him back in his presence. This is where the spirit of Absalom comes in. Now, mind you, let's refresh our memory. In Proverbs, it says, these are some things that the Lord hates. A haughty eyes, a lying tongue, a heart that devises wicked plans, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. So we're still talking about how discord works, and we're talking about the spirit of Absalom. So this is what Absalom does. Because his spirit wasn't right, okay? He's back in favor with his father. And so Absalom has a plan. So he has things in his heart that have not been resolved. Absalom doesn't just want to be in favor with his father. Absalom wants his father's kingdom, okay? So it looks like he's on his father's side, but he's got a plan in his heart. So when the people come into the city, Jerusalem, when they would come into the city, they had to come through the gates. The gate weren't, gates weren't open all the time. So what Absalom did was got himself a little chariot and everything, and he parked himself at the gates every day. And every day for four years, in the Bible it says 40, but other translations, many other translations say four. So, and David only ruled for 40 years, so it couldn't have been 40 years. Okay, all right, so for four years, four years, then we already know that he can wait to get his, because he waited two years to kill his brother, Okay. For four years, he's at the gate every day. The people come, they have their cases that they want to bring to David. They may or may not get to see King David, right? He's a busy man. But they come, and Absalom, he strikes up a conversation with them all. How, you know, what's, what's going on? Where are you from? What city are you from? And he tells them, and he's like, well, what's your situation? And, and they, they tell him the situation, and he's like, man, you know? Man, I wish I, wish I could see your case. I wish I could hear your case out. You got a really good case there. Man, I wish I could hear your case out because, you know, if I, if I could hear your case out, I would give you some justice. They're like, oh, man, thank you so much, Absalom, for hearing me. They wanted to bow to him. He was like, oh, no, no, don't bow to me. Don't bow to me. And he would, he would, then he would just hug him and kiss him. Okay, we're talking about Middle Eastern greetings, okay, so nothing weird in that. So this is what he would do. Every day for four years, he stood at the gate of the city, and he talked to people, befriended them, made them feel good. Told a man, I tell you, I wish I could hear your case because I would totally give you justice. You totally got a case. No telling who he told this, right? He could have told this to X person. The X person could have been wise enemy. He probably told them both the same thing. But this is what Absalom was doing. He was winning over the hearts of the people so he could get his agenda. See, discord doesn't always look ugly. It's always ugly to God, but it doesn't always look ugly to us. What do you mean? Absalom is friendly. He's handsome. He's friendly. He's the son of the king. What? So he was winning over the hearts of the people. So now I'm going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 15. And I am going to read verses 1 through 6. Actually, I really just 
talked it out, so maybe I won't read that. Um, people tried to bow, he wouldn't, yeah. I, read, I, I just explained all of that, so I'm not going to read that. So Absalom, for four years, he works, and he wins over the people's hearts. And after he gets enough love, enough loyalty from others, he stirs up a rebellion against his father, the king. You have to, this story is so, is complex in the sense that there's not just one or two in persons involved, but um, Absalom was, how he stirred up his rebellion. He said, oh, you know, when I was in exile, I promised God that I would go and make a sacrifice to him in XYZ town. So father, can I go and make this sacrifice? And dad was like, yes, go ahead and make this sacrifice. So he went out. He said, can I take some people with me? Yeah, of course. He, brought, he invited guests. Now, this is what Absalom did. They didn't know what his plan was, but he had won their favor. You hear what I'm saying? They didn't know what he planned in his heart, but they, he had won their favor. So unsuspectingly, they went with him. And then Absalom holds a face in his own honor, basically, and has people declare, you know, basically, he's declared himself the king. And he gets troops. I mean, he rallies troops because, remember, for four years, everybody who's coming into the city, he's been winning their hearts over. And he begins to rally troops so that he can fight against his father. Let me tell you, because his father left him unchecked, David had to flee the city. David, the mighty warrior, the man after God's own heart, had to flee the city behind his son's rebellion. Okay? Okay. So David fled the city. Now... I just want to bring out one other individual. Absalom also won over one of David's chief counselors. His chief counselor's name was Ahithophel. Okay? Now, some of you probably already know this. Ahithophel was, the Bible says that when he, he was so wise that when he spoke, it was like God spoke. That's just how good he was. That's how wise he was. But what we don't, we didn't really know, it's not told directly, is that Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather hmm. now he is wise so he does know where his bread is buttered okay but he's still Bathsheba's grandfather Bathsheba who was married to somebody who loved her Bathsheba who David the king took for himself while she was married when he had so many concubines Bathsheba's grandfather, this is Ahithophel, Bathsheba who became pregnant and her first child died because of David's sin. Bathsheba who could not possibly have had a good time in the harem, I call it, with all the other wives. Can you imagine because of the way that she came in, what her life must have been, how those women looked at her? Bathsheba whose husband who loved her, David killed. This was David's chief counselor, the grandfather of Bathsheba. So he was wise, he did what he was supposed to, but as soon as Absalom had this rebellion, Ahithophel turned and he went with Absalom. So this, these are the types of hearts that were won over. Now when Absalom uh, made his rebellion, God began to deal, and I, I don't want to give all the details because it can get long, it really is long, but God took the judgment of these people out of the hands of David, Okay? David still favored Absalom. He ran from him. Absalom bounded up an army. David had to, the people who were with him, he had to get, he had to number them and start arranging them in ranks and everything so he could fight. But he still loved that son. He still favored that son now because he said, listen, have mercy on Absalom for my sake. Traitors should not be allowed to live in that day. But he was his son who he favored, who he had not checked who turned the hearts of the people. So he was like, just spare him for me. But God took his judgment out of David's hands. Um, and so for Ahithophel, what he did was he turned his counsel. All right? His counsel was still wise, but he caused Absalom not to listen to it. And I told you Ahithophel was wise. So when he saw that his advice wasn't taken, he knew it was over for him. And he went, he got his house in order, and he committed suicide. Okay, because God chose to not honor his judgment because of the way he turned against the authority. Okay. Absalom. Absalom, I told you about all that hair he had, right? He only cut it once a year. 
So his hair was long again. This is how we need to make sure we say humble before God because God can bring us low. You know how you got killed? Absalom is riding on his, whatever his animal was, and his hair gets caught in the trees. How embarrassing. How humiliating. This beautiful hair gets caught in the trees, and he's hanging from the tree by his hair, can't get out. This is, I'm telling you, this is how he came to his end. Now, David said, have mercy, but Joab was, was hard-headed. Joab, the captain of guard, he did his own thing. He met his end in Solomon's reign, but Joab did what he wanted to. Now, I, David said, don't touch him, but Joab was like, they said, well, look, we saw Absalom hanging from a tree. What are you talking about? Kill him. Did you kill him? No, we ain't touching him. That's just, uh-uh. David said on his, I got this. And he went and he killed Absalom while he was hanging from the tree with that beautiful hair. And that's how he met his end. I wanted to finish the story for you. So even though David wanted to spare Absalom's life, God took matters into his own hand. He allowed him to be killed because you do not come against authority any kind of way. He's so discord. He won the hearts of the people. The people didn't even know what he had planned. And it wasn't until... Everybody had told David, and David had anointed Solomon king, and they had him riding through the streets and saying, long live King Solomon. Then they were like, oh, shoot, we got to go. So, and they did. They ran. They were like, I'm out of here. But that spirit of Absalom, deception at work, subversive, it appears that that person, that that person is with leadership. It appears that way, but the truth is they have another plan. Let me give you a, a, an example. Well, I'm going to start my own Bible study. That, not, not saying that there's anything necessarily wrong, but then you want to invite everybody in the church, in this house, to your Bible study, and you haven't talked to the leadership. That's the spirit of Absalom. Right? Well, the pastor, he ain't doing this, so we're just going to get together and do this for ourselves. But you're going to invite people in this house and not talk to leadership. That's the spirit of Absalom. Or you're ambitious, and so you say, well, you know, if I was a leader, I would do X, Y, and Z, you know? Because you're planning for when you're a leader that you're going to have your ducks in a row so that you get the support that you're not giving to your leaders. That's the spirit of Absalom. It's deception at work. God doesn't like that. I'm just saying. He's not into that. Sowing discord, right? Planning evils. You got your plans in place. Listen, the call of God calls all of us to something. You don't have to try to get somebody else's position. There are enough sinners out there for all of us to win a whole bunch of souls, okay? <laughs> enough demons for all of us to fight and get somebody delivered. You don't have to try. This is one branch of Zion. You don't have to come into branch of Zion and try to bogart your way in. you elbowing people out and you're causing strife because you want to be something, but you already are something because God placed his love upon you, called you by his name, cleaned you up and delivered you from hell. Can't get any better. So this is, these are two of the ways that discord operates. Be, be aware of it. Be alert. Know how it is operating, okay? When you recognize that spirit at work, don't take part in it. Say, mm -mm, I don't think that's right. Did you talk to the apostle? I didn't hear them announcing anything like that. No, no, I'm sorry, I can't come. I don't care if it's your best friend. It's either God or your best friend, right? Okay? So we don't want to take part in it, and God knows we don't want to be the ones doing it. We don't want to be the ones doing it because, see, the apostle may not necessarily come at you the way, right, because he's got mercy. The Lord kind of holds his hand back sometimes, but God himself might take your discipline in his own hands. We don't want that. We don't want you hanging from a tree by your hair. I'm just kidding. But I'm just saying, we don't want that. Okay, so how do we overcome discord? And I have a few things that I, they laid out. You know, we just need to stay before God. But I have a few, uh, a few things. How do we overcome this? The first way I have is know what God wants. Psalm 133, 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. That's what God wants. He wants unity. Not unison, unity. I mean, you may not always agree, but you're still singing the same song. And it's still a beautiful melody to God's ears. 
You still take your offense. Somebody offended you. You say, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to call anybody, Lord. I need you to deal with this because I know how I have to deal with it, but it's hard. Right? That's harmony. So we have to know what God wants. He wants unity. Psalm 133, 1. He wants unity. Then we have to, something very simple, do your best to get along with other people. That's simple. Well, the statement is simple. Romans 12, 18 is the scripture for that. It says, if possible, so far as it, as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The New Living Translation says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do all that you can, not well, look, if somebody come up at me, I'm, I got, I'm, no, no, you do all that you can, meaning sometimes we have to close our mouth. Sometimes we have to walk away. Sometimes we have to get on our knees and say, Lord, you got to help me. I've stood up multiple times asking the Lord to help me to forgive somebody because I still hadn't, I knew it, I knew it was still in my heart until he resolved it. Okay. So that was the second thing. Do your best to get along with others. Okay. Let's not be sowers of discord or strife or perpetuators of it. I didn't start it, but I sure know how to finish it. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Okay. We don't want to do that. All right. Number three, don't be a busybody. We're talking about how to combat discord. Don't be a busybody. First Peter chapter four, verse 15. First Peter 4, 15. It says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, boy, those are really bad things. A murderer, a thief, an evildoer, and guess what else? Or as a busybody in other men's matters. Right up there with the murderer and the thief. Right? One version says meddler. Don't suffer because you're a meddler. If you're suffering for, for the name of Christ, that's one thing. But if you're suffering because you're in people's business, that's a whole other thing. Right? So in order to combat discord, we want to make sure that we're not a busybody. We'd have to know everything that's going on. We got to hear everything that's going on. Some of us like to invent everything that's going on because something has to be going on, right? The next way that we can combat discord is to speak well of others consistently. Meaning don't just say something nice every now and then, but make it a consistent thing. Speak well of others consistently. You know that nice little saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That's, my, that's what we're going to have to practice. Um, James chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. James chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, and also James chapter 4, verse 11. James 3, 8 and 9 says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. And then he says, my brothers, these things ought not to be. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. You better get out of my face before I... Right? God, you're so good. Did you see what she looked like? These things ought not to be. So we need to speak well of others consistently. Or just keep your mouth closed. I'm a person, I have strong opinions. <laughs> All of my opinions are right, by the way. <laughs> no, right, so this, I'm saying I have strong opinions and that's how I feel when I express them. But I'm working on speaking, uh, just, just mm, don't say anything. Because nobody asks your opinion. It, and it matters to you, but sometimes it really doesn't matter. You don't have to say it. Uh, James 4.11 says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. In other words, if you think that you are qualified to talk to judge someone else's actions, then that makes you the judge and not a follower of God. But there's really only one true just judge, Right? It's our father. And no matter how much discernment you have, we are still human beings, still in these, these uh, death doomed bodies, as, as the apostle likes to say, right? Still in this flesh, this human nature. And it's human nature to say something ugly every now and then. You know, it's human nature to get things wrong every now and then. It's kind of what we do. So 
we can't be a judge because we're still capable of error. And so my discernment doesn't mean that I can judge you. My discernment is supposed to be so that I can pray for you. Right? If you discern that somebody has a spirit of Absalom, that is not for you to go and start sowing discord by saying, yeah, listen, the Lord revealed this to me. And you know that brother, that sister ain't right. Well, are you really producing the fruits of righteousness in that conversation? Right? Not really. He probably gave you that discernment so you could pray. Pray for the church, pray for that person. Yeah. Your prayer is going to do more than your words would. Your prayer is going to do more than just your, your conversation will. Much more. Um, so we're speaking well of others consistently. The other thing that we're going to do is mind our own business. 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your own hands, just as we instructed you before. Make it your goal to mind your own business. Sometimes you just don't have to know. That's painful. If you're of a curious nature, it really is. I, I, I should know. <laughs> but sometimes you just don't have to know. And it's okay. It's okay. We're going to mind our own business. And then we're going to forgive one another. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Forgive one another. Colossians 3, 12, 13 says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on, like clothe yourself with compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you so you must also forgive. It's a big sin burden that he lifted off of our shoulders. It's a big deal. For each one of us sitting here who have given our hearts to Christ, we have the comfort in knowing that we don't have to spend an eternity in hell. What a beautiful gift. We weren't capable of reaching those sin places and cleaning that up. But he did it for us. But you can't forgive somebody who says something ugly to you. I can't forgive you because you looked at me the wrong way or because you lied about me. It's painful. It's ugly. But I'm going to heaven and I want to reflect the nature of God. So we forgive one another. We bear with one another. Lord, here she come. Oh, God, Lord. But we bear with one another, right? And somewhere else in the word, it says the strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak. So that's, this is what we are to do. The last thing that came to me about how we're still combating discord. The last thing that came to me was know your purpose. Know your purpose. Ephesians 5, 17. It says, don't act thoughtlessly but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. How is that combining discord? Because if I know my purpose, I'm not going to get out of line and, and start being in your lane. I can stay in my lane. If I know that I'm meant to be an intercessor, then I know that what God reveals to me about someone is so that I can pray. And that's what I'm going to do because I know my purpose. But if I don't know that that's my purpose and God's revealing things to me about people, then I might think that it's my job to let other people know about it. Because I'm not walking in purpose. And so I'm so in discord. Not thinking, well, I ain't trying to say anything bad, but you know, the Lord showed me this, so you know it's the truth. Really? Think about the fruit. The, the Bible says you'll know them by your fruit. How do you know what a tree is if the fruit is not being born on it? Like if you walk up to a tree and there's an orange on it and an apple on it and a lemon on it and a lime on it, what kind of tree is that? A confused tree. And you know that God is not the author of a confusion. You'll know them by your fruit. I know that you're a child of God by your fruit. You know that I'm a child of God by my fruit. Sinners know that we're children of God because of our fruit. They may not know everything about us, but they know that that's a good tree because the fruit off of it is good. Sowing the fruits of righteousness. Sowing peace. Sowing love and, and bearing, being able to bear with one another. That's the fruit that we're producing. 
And so if I know my purpose, I'm actually, I'm fighting discord because I know that I'm staying in the order that God has for me. See, if I think that I'm supposed to be the preacher, but the Lord really wants you to be a marketplace minister where you just minister to people that you're talking to, right? I'm going to be fighting. I'm going to be striving to be the preacher. God put a word in my belly. Praise the Lord. Right? I got to say this. I just got to say it. And you, I'm out of order because I don't know my purpose. So now I'm sowing discord because now it comes out like musicians playing the different song at the same time. It comes out, and those of you who have discernment, now you're like, mm, that ain't right. So now you have to fight the discord in you. You have to fight the propensity to say, you know that wasn't right. And it wasn't right, but now you have to fight because I'm out of order because I don't know what my purpose is. Right? See, it's, it's, it's a snowball effect. So in finding out what God wants you to do, in, in understanding what the will of the Lord is for your life, then you're, you're sowing unity. Because if I know I'm supposed to be a servant, not the leader or a leader, then I won't be striving to be a leader out of place. You know? Or if I know that I'm supposed to be a leader and not in the background, then there won't be an empty spot where I'm supposed to be because I'm, you know, walking in humility, praise the Lord. It's just disobedience. <laughs> it's not humility. Not if you're supposed to be somewhere and you know it, right? So these are how we fight discord. So we have to see the end goal. What God wants is unity. What God wants is unity. See, the spirits of darkness work in unity. They, they don't, aren't capable of loving one another, but that order is there. So they know when, when, when they're sent to do, wreak havoc over here, they just wreak havoc over there. But see, God has given us free will. He's not going to make us do it. So now we have to comply. We have to lay our will down so that unity will manifest in the body. It's not automatic. We all know it's not automatic. We know it's not completely easy to serve God all the time. Some of the things he wants us to do, we don't want to do. Some of the things he doesn't want us to do, we want to do anyway. You know, um, it's not easy. But we have to see the end goal. The end goal is unity. Unity in the body, that the body of Christ is saying the same things. We're operating with the same purpose. We're walking together. We're not just getting to the same destination the way we want to get there. And that we're alert to the enemy's schemes and devices. That we know our enemy so that when, if the enemy came in and we were all armed, this time we know our position. We know where we're supposed to stand so that we're not aiming at each other because the devil is using her today. How do you know? She could be hurting and just manifesting it that way. You know what I mean? But when you fire back, the devil is using you today. <laughs> you understand? So we learn our position and then we know. Some of us aren't, aren't armed for that. Some of us are like, okay, my job is to protect. So I'm, you start moving people out of the way. But you know what your purpose is, and you're serving in it. And now we're not shooting each other. You're just throwing spiritual barbs, saying ugly things to each other in Jesus' name. Right? <laughs> saying holy, ugly things, no such thing. But you, you understand what I'm saying? Because we understand the will of the Lord. We understand who we are. We're striving to mind our own business. As much as I really would like to know what's going on in your life, if I'm not talking to you and asking you about it and sharing with you, then I guess I just won't find out. Instead of saying, well, what does someone so tell you? Right? I'm striving to um, not be a busybody. Listen, let me tell you what so-and-so is doing. That's that spirit of Absalom, Minister Tricia was talking about. I'm a busybody. And then I'm, I'm back over there with the person that I just accused. And I said, mm-hmm, mm, mm, mm. That sounds like a plan. Then I go over here and I'm saying something. Busybody. Busybody. But because I understand the nature of discord and I understand or I'm coming to an understanding of what I'm supposed to do, now I'm walking in a spirit of unity. You know, that's when somebody says to you, well, let's do X, Y, and Z. You're like, mm-mm, mm-mm. That's not what the Lord called me to do. You know what he called me to do? He called me to sit myself down and pray and intercede. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm not preaching. I'm not going out there. You understand what I'm saying? Because I know my purpose and my role. Whatever your role is, 
Okay, and there's so many gifts in the body, and they don't all manifest on Sunday morning. Most of the gifts manifest Monday through Saturday. And that's where we are most useful. Because remember, there are enough sinners out there that we can all be used of God and come back Sunday happy, fulfilled, not striving for mastery in another man's house. Those of you who like to cook, you don't want somebody walking up in your kitchen cooking your own, cooking. What the, what? If you don't sit down. I don't cook, so that's not my reaction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But you understand, right? You understand that when you're in someone else's house or that they're the ones governing something, that they're the ones who should order what goes where, who does what. So we see the end goal. The end goal is unity. And the last thing I'm going to do is read the scripture from Ephesians chapter 4, several pieces. But I, I, before I read it, I will make a note while you're turning. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then I'm going to read verses 31 through 32. And I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. But pay attention to the fact that this first part of the scripture comes right before he starts talking about gifts in the body. Okay? So the gifts are for unity. All right, Ephesians. It says, therefore I, uh, Paul is talking, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit. Just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. Verse 31 it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, slander is telling something not true about someone. Denigrating them, bringing them down with your tongue. As well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. That's our goal. God bless you all. Yeah. that? Glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, 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 glory. We're going to ask the musicians to make their way here, hallelujah, glory to God, hallelujah. I know my toes are sore, <laughs> which I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that. If I be real with myself, you know, I'm all right with that. Hallelujah. I'm getting some help today. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm getting some help. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. You heard what was said. It was quiet in the house. I say either they sleeping. <laughs> Are they listening very carefully? So I'm going to go with the latter. You're listening. <laughs> you were listening very, very carefully. And because you were listening very, very carefully, you're like me. You want some help. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. It's almost like God was saying, here's the, the problem. What I want to speak to you. Hallelujah.
But then he gives the solution. She gave a whole slew of how we can come up out of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm going to open the altar. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Minister Latricia to come back. Hallelujah. And pray. Hallelujah. Our minister as she sees fit. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. The only way I'm going to get some help, people of God, is I have to be honest. Hallelujah. So I'm going to turn it back over to her. Hallelujah. And the altar is open. Hallelujah.